is the former 1992 MVP of the Fiesta Bowl for the Penn State Nittany Lions. Then he went to the NFL as a first-round draft pick as the Miami Dolphins played with them all the way up to 2000. And now he works for the Finn side along with my good buddy Sam Madison, and that's O.J. McDuffie. O.J., Zach Gelp here, Temple Sports Hour. How are you? Hey, Zach, what's going on, man? I'm doing pretty good, partner. I'm doing great myself, and I actually watched a YouTube video of yourself yesterday bowling a 300. What What is O.J. McDuffie not able to do? Oh, man. Well, you know, in order to bowl a 300, you got to get pretty lucky. You know, the lanes have to be right. Your, your stroke has to be right. But uh, the, the irony of the whole thing, Zach, is that I, I bowled 299 twice. So I've choked twice before I got to that, that, you know, that 300 level. Well, I was watching Hard Knocks, and now you work with Finsider, so you're all covering the Miami Dolphins. I bet you some of those receivers they uh, picked up this year are from the bowling alleys. That receiving core is weak. <laughs> the, 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 the receivers, yeah, it's, it's not as good as it, uh, you know, everybody thinks it should be. But at the same time, though, man, you know, you've seen a lot of receiving cores that don't have a, a per se superstar, but they work well as a committee. And I think this group can get better as a committee. Now, I was at Radio Row for the Super Bowl, and I was talking to Channing Crowder, a former Miami Dolphin, and you could sense he had some animosity towards Jeff Ireland. Do you believe Jeff Ireland is moving the Miami Dolphins in the right direction? Well, you know what? Jeff is, uh, you know, it's a GM job I talked about the other day. is probably the toughest job in football. You know, because you get some first, second, third rounders that, you know, were studs in college, and they don't pan out at the pro level. And you get some sixth, seventh rounders that become stars. So, you know, it's so hit and miss at times. But you look at some of the guys who brought in the free agency, like a Reggie Bush or a Cameron Wake. You know, I think you can judge them in, in situations like that. Uh, so it, it's a tough job for Jeff Ireland. Now, we got going going forward now, you know, you look at a, a, you get a quarterback in, in the eighth pick and Ryan Tannehill and a guy like uh, Michael Agnew in the third round, uh, Jonathan Martin, or, you know, a tackle from Stanford in the second round. Which of those guys stand out before you start, you know, decide whether, you know, Ireland's done a good job or not. It's a tough job, though. I wouldn't want that job. We're talking to O.J. McDuffie, and O.J., you played at Penn State from 1988 to 1992, and you were a stud. What is your reaction after you've been able to digest everything that's gone on in the last few months with the sanctions handed down by the NCAA? Well, obviously what happened at Penn State was just a terrible and horrible situation. Um, and, I, and, I, and I feel bad for the kids and, and the family you know, it's going to be affected for the rest of their lives because of this. And, and what probably more is probably how long it went on, you know, um, with, with the situation. You know, Jerry Sandusky, you know, I hate to even mention his name, that monster, he fooled a lot of people. Obviously, he fooled a lot of people for a long time. And uh, it's just a tough situation. But what bothers me, too, though, Zach, is that, you know, the whole Penn State is being vilified for this one monster. And that's what I don't like. Uh, obviously, the kids are way more important than anything else. But I hate that people judge Penn State based on this one guy. You were a receiver, so you weren't part of linebacker you, but I'm sure you had some kind of relationship with Jerry Sandusky. What was that relationship like? Honestly, Zach, I thought Jerry was a great guy. I really did. I, you know, he was a, obviously a great coach at that time, but, uh, you know, I, I'm involved in my own foundation out here. Because Catch 81. Of some of the work I did with, yeah, Catch 81 Foundation because of some of the work that I did with Second Mile. You know, I thought it was always important to give back and be able to help out as much as possible. And uh, so it's, it's unfortunate, I think, that Jerry used a lot of people in what he was doing, uh, including the players, to get them to hang out with some of the kids or whatnot. But uh, I, I thought Jerry was a, well, a big kid and a, good, a great guy at that point. Obviously, my feelings have changed towards him. It's so tough to go back and second-guess things, but is, does anything make sense to you now after knowing Jerry for so many years and after hearing all the reports that say, oh, you know, something that happened in practice, maybe that hinted towards what was actually going on. Does anything now make sense to you, OJ, about what happened? Not at all. Uh, you know, it's, it's still shocking to me. You know, I mean, uh, Jerry's one of those guys that got along with everybody, offense, defense, teams. You know, he wasn't a coach that just dealt with defensive guys. He was cool with everybody on the team, so... Um, it's still pretty shocking to me. Uh, and once I found out about it, I was like, there's no way Jerry Sandusky did that. And, uh, you know, obviously we were all fooled, like I said. Zach Gelb here, WHIP, Philly's number one college radio station on Temple Sports Hour. We're talking to Penn State great O.J. McDuffie. The Owls play Penn State this weekend, 3.30 up in Happy Valley. And let's talk about your former head coach, the late Joe Paterno. Uh, what's your view on Joe Pa now after knowing everything that went on? Well, you know what? I think a lot still needs to be told. Um, I think this thing is a lot deeper than what they want to talk about with Joe, uh, just on the surface. I think um, once they dig a little deeper, and, they, and I assume they will, they'll find out that 
you know, that uh, some, some higher ups really knew what was going on. And, and, and whatever Joe is accused of doing, you know, he, he, he said in hindsight that he would have done more. But uh, I think Joe was discussing with the whole situation. And I don't think that Joe had the power, honestly, to uh, to do much more with Jerry Dusky. I think the university had a lot more authority over the situation. And they had it in their hands. And I think they blew it. Well, you flew up to Happy Valley uh, before Joe Paterno passed away um, after he got fired. What was that visitation like for you? And how, and how was the coach acting? The coach was, he was upset. He really was. He was, he was really upset. You know, obviously football in uh, Penn State University was Joe's life, and both of those were taken away from him, you know, you know in, a, in a heartbeat. But at the same time, you know, Joe, uh, you know, Joe is all about us. He's all about the kids. He really is. You know, Joe does, you know, things beyond football. And uh, he did things beyond football. And, um, you know, you see Joe at every single sporting event, every single fundraiser. You see Joe at Thon. That has nothing to do with football. You know, Joe was the person that cared about, you know, Penn State University and, and what Penn State University brought to this world, not, you know, not just what it brought for the football program. So uh, I, I know what type of person Joe was. People can say that Joe was a fake or a phony and he was this. You can't, it's hard to think it for 61 years, you know, that his program was what it was. 61 years in terms of, you know, trying to make players better people, better fathers, better sons, and better people in society. At covering this event for over the last um, of several months, this is the general notion that I get about Joe Paterno. Nine, and I want to hear from a former Penn State player if you believe this is a fair notion. 99% of the things Joe Paterno did for Penn State University were great. They were outstanding. Donating libraries, constantly giving back to the student body, um, building these uh, people on the field, you know, these boys making them into men, getting them into the NFL, preaching about schoolwork. But that one thing that he didn't do, that one phone call that he didn't make or follow up with, totally is going to kill his legacy. Is that fair for Joe Paterno? That's fair for people outside of Joe that don't know Joe. And that's what, that's a, lot, that's what a lot of people that don't know Joe, that's what they want. Because they, they always want to, people always want to bring a great person down. And, you know, talking about the follow-up, I mean, everybody talks about that. And then you hear everybody from the state of Pennsylvania talk about, you know, people's obligation and responsibility. You know, once you hand it over to the authorities, if, if, you, if you were robbed, you know, it's your house, and, and obviously it's not the same level, obviously. But just in, in any criminal case, once you head over to the authorities, you expect them to do the proper investigation and go through the proper channels and do things they're supposed to do. And uh, once something is investigated, and they come back, say the 98 incident, and say that, you know, nothing was founded, what is Joe supposed to do at that point? Then you get another incident, and, and supposedly in 2001, which, which happened, and then, you know, this, you know, Joe is already livid about the situation as it is. But then, you know, you hand it over to the authorities again, what is Joe supposed to do? Continue to call and do his own investigation? Nobody does that. You know, Joe wish he'd done more. Maybe, maybe he should have done more. Maybe somebody else could have done more. But the proper people had this situation, and they, they blew it at the top. This is the, the toughest part for me to fathom with dealing with Joe Paterno, that he knew to a certain extent what was going on, and he was still able to work with Jerry Sandusky for a plethora more of years. Isn't that just a problem? Let, let's say, uh, let's say OJ, you saw something at Finsider that one of your colleagues was harassing another colleague. How would you work with that colleague again, knowing what went on? That's the toughest part for me to get off my chest, is that Paterno knew what Sandusky was doing, according to McQuarrie, because he reported it to Paterno, but then he was still able to look Sandusky in the eye and work with him. That's where the toughest part for me is, and that's where I believe Joe Paterno is at fault. Well, where did Jerry? Where did Joe work with Jerry at after that? After '98, Jerry was done coaching for for, the, for Penn State. But he still allowed him in the program. He, Jerry was not in the program. Jerry was done at that point, and the university granted Jerry a merit of status after that. So the university, knowing everything that was going on, gave Jerry the best carte blanche throughout the whole university. He could go anywhere anywhere on campus that he wanted to. Joe wanted out of his football facility. And apparently, in my opinion, I think that's why Jerry showed up to the facility after hours because he knew he wasn't allowed or wanted in that building. So that's what people don't get. Jerry was done coaching, what, 98, 99? Yep. Jerry was off the staff. So, you know, that's when so, so Joe didn't work with Jerry after that. But he was still in the facility. Now, when, now when Joe was there, you know, all the incidents you're talking about, they're eyewitnesses from janitor, janitors, you know, which means that he was there after hours, late at night, you know, where nobody was around. So Jerry knew what, what he was doing and when to go over there because he had keys from the university. 
We're talking O.J. McDuffie, former Penn State wideout from 1988 to 1992. Bill O'Brien has such a rigorous task here because he has to prove a lot of doubters wrong. And I personally believe this season for the Penn State Nittany Lions is more about wins than losses. I'm just wondering, let's say Bill O'Brien, you're back at 17 years old, O.J. Bill O'Brien comes up to you and says, I want you to play for Penn State University. With all the negative criticism still going on, would you accept a scholarship to play for Penn State nowadays? Well, you know what? That's a tough question. It really is, because I wasn't a Penn State fan coming out of, out of high school. So I, I probably wouldn't because of that. But if I was a guy that that, that went that was from Pennsylvania and always wanted to go to Penn State, I definitely would. If I'm a receiver, tight end, quarterback that wants to try to get to the next level, I would definitely consider going to Penn State. A wide receiver, Robinson, right now, uh, leads the Big Ten in receptions. I could imagine having that many catches and yards through three weeks in, you know, at Penn State. I got there one time, I think we threw the ball ten times in, in a game. So uh, it's, it's a completely different situation when you talk about it. But if, if, if I had Coach O'Brien as a coach, I, I, would, I would love to be in that Penn State offense right now. You said you didn't grow up as a Penn State fan. I'm just wondering, how did Joe Paterno convince you to go to Penn State? Well, you know, I, you know, I visited Michigan, Ohio State, UCLA, Notre Dame, and, and, uh, and Penn State. And uh, just so when I went to visit Penn State, uh, the players, just the way they were, the, you know, you know the, the way they carried themselves, everything about the program was, you know, it, it was impressive to me and my, my family. You know, Joe also didn't promise me anything. You know, he, the only thing he promised me is that I could play baseball after my, after my, I, I did spring ball one time. So things like that, you know, Joe gave me the plus and minus of going to Penn State, didn't promise me anything. And uh, I just, that's what I, that's what I love most about it. When I got back from UCLA trip, I got home to a, a six, seven page, a uh, spiral notebook, FedEx copies from Joe, outlining the pros and cons of going to Penn State. It wasn't all just good stuff that he was telling me about, but he, he realized that Penn State was probably the best place for me. And I think if it wasn't for Joe, you know, there's no way in the world I'd have gone to Penn State. I'd probably go to Ohio State, which is my second choice, which is where I'm from. It's really a travesty what went on, and there's a large percentage of blame that should be on Jerry Sandusky because he is the monster in this case, but other people have to be held accountable, and there's certain percentages such as Paterno, Curly, Scholes, Spanier, uh, all those people that were involved with the cover-up. But I'm just curious, if you had to pick one word to describe Joe Paterno, what would that be and why? Well, you know, one word is kind of hard um, to, to describe Joe with one word. And, um, you know... And you can't take away what did happen at the university from what you say about Joe. But I, I know Joe was an amazing man. And I know what he did for my life. And I know what he's done for a lot of guys that, you know, go on to Penn State that play ball and didn't, go to, and didn't play football for Penn State. People that just go to university in general. But I think he's, I think he's an amazing person that has that 1% that you want to talk about. Uh, flaw on a situation that, you know, he could have done more. He, he felt that he should have done more. But it really wasn't Joe Paterno. Anybody... You know, you talk to nowadays, you think that Joe Paterno was a guy in the shower with a little boy instead of Jerry Sandusky, the monster. Well, that's not how it should be, but th there is a certain percentage of blame that should be on Paterno, and I do think you understand that just because, you know, he, there was a cover-up. He could have went to the next step. Did he go to the next step? That's yeah, the exactly. big question. You, know what I'm saying? you sound like you're, you are, you, you're, you're like the rest of the people that are all want to put this all on Joe. You want to put, you, you sound like it's all about Joe. No, 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 no. I, you I ran, you oh. ran the report yourself. You, you saw how the, the, the information went up the chain of command. You, you know as well as anybody. You, I mean, I mean, you're, you're, you're a personality, a radio personality. At least somebody should do their homework on the whole situation instead of going by what you saw on TV. OJ. What you read in the future report, which had none of the main characters interviewed. How is that as credible as you want to make it out to be, Zach? O OJ, I don't want you to get this wrong whatsoever. Jerry Sandusky is a monster. The guy should never see a light of day whatsoever. He is fully accountable for what happened at Penn State. But I do believe a certain percentage of blame, and that could be a small percentage of blame, but it's still a percentage of blame, has to go on Joe Paterno's watch. Because from everything that I've heard, and I'm not at Penn State, so I, I don't necessarily know what goes on in and out. But one thing I do understand is Joe Paterno had some of the most power at Penn State. Are there still a lot of details to come out, yes, this thing is going to get ugly before it gets better for Penn State. I still think we have to see some of those details, but what from I read from the reports, Joe Paterno, and I think you can agree with this with me, does have to be held accountable to some extent. Is he up at the extentage of Jerry Sandusky? No, that would be completely ludicrous. Jerry Sandusky is a monster. It makes me sick to even mention his names on the, on the airwaves, and what he did is disgusting, and he should be held accountable, and he is, and he's going to be going to jail, and he should never see the light of
light of day again. But at the end of the day, this was a massive cover up. It just one person didn't just cover this up. It was Spanier. It was Curly. It was Schultz. It was Paterno. It was Sandusky. Many people and many people had, knew what was going on at this university. And that's why some people in the media blame Joe Paterno to a certain extent. But I don't want you to get confused whatsoever. In no way whatsoever should anyone think Joe Paterno should be held more accountable than Jerry Sandusky because that's just ludicrous to me. But why is Joe Paterno held more accountable than the president of the university, the uh, athletic director, or the head of security for the university when those guys were received all, received all the information? Joe's a football coach that, that handed up the chain of command just like a teacher would or just like if something would happen in the science building, you know, but they shut down the whole science department. You know, some, it, it, that's the most amazing part to me is that what Joe did, you know, Maybe you did the minimum, but at the same time, people want to blame you for just doing the minimum or doing what he was supposed to do. Because you I, sound like that type of person to me. Well, well, no, no, no. I, I, I don't want, I don't want you to get me wrong in any way. Jerry Sandusky should be held accountable fully, but Paterno's at some extent. But I'll answer your question because everything that we've read, everything that we've seen from outside the line, all these reports, to me, what I get out of it is that, you know, you look at Paterno and to some extent, everyone looks at Joe Paterno and they think he is Penn State. He had the most power. And, you know, that could be a, a valid argument. But did he go to his higher ups or didn't go to his higher ups? Uh, you know, it, it, this thing has so much at work in it right now. I still believe that we still need to get more answers before you could put a full percentage of blame on people. But I just don't want and I hope I didn't come off this way to you, OJ, because I really like you. You're great at what you do with Finsiders. You are a great player for Penn State and a great player player for the Miami Dolphins, and I love the work you do. I don't want you to think for any second that I'm putting Jerry Sandusky above, uh, but below Joe Paterno where the blame falls here. I don't want you to think that whatsoever, and I hope it didn't come off that way. No, my, my thing is this, though. You know, everything is based off of, you know, the free report. You know, everybody's going off this free report and things like that, which then they're talking about how many millions, 4.5 million uh, emails are talking about, but Joe's name is mentioned twice. 4.5 million emails with Joe's name is missing twice, you know? And so with that being said, how do they, how do they draw the conclusions on Joe's part in this whole thing when his name is missing twice in 4.5 million emails? So I'm, I'm trying to figure it out myself. I think that my, my, whole, my whole point is this. I'm all about due process, you know? And there's some guys that haven't talked, haven't said a word. I'd like to hear more from McQuarrie. Of course, we want to hear from Joe. And of course, we want to hear from... Uh, from Curly, and, and that's the whole, that's the bottom line. But everybody's already persecuted Joe. Nobody's even saying anything about Curly and Schultz anymore. It's all Joe's fault. Well, well, I did. To, to, to be fair, I did. I said Curly, Schultz, Spanier, Paterno, Sandusky, all of them have to be looked at. I did say that to you in this interview. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that. But then, then you did. But, I, I, but I, I'm still, I'm still sensing that, you know, you feel that Joe should have, a, a, you say, a, a part of blame. I think you give him a lot of the blame. Because you're saying, well, how do you look him in the eyes? He works in the building with him, how do you, which is all false as well. Obviously, we look at this, Jerry Sandusky is the monster. And no one should take anything far away from that. Exactly. exactly. Here's, here's yeah. the thing, man. You, you asked me to do an interview about Penn State Temple, you know, and obviously you wanted you had another agenda on your mind. If, that, if that's the case, my man, you know, then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Penn State Temple another day. Is that cool? Uh, OJ, I don't want you to hang up. I want to ask you one more question about Temple, Penn State. You look at this game. How'd you view Temple when you went up going up against Penn State years ago? Because Temple has not beat Penn State since 1941. How'd you view them as a program? Uh, Temple's always tough to play against. Always tough to play against. A uh, hard-hitting team. Uh, I think what, the way we beat Temple a lot of times is we had a little more depth than they had. Uh, first couple quarters always seem to be a dog fight with those guys. And, uh, you know, and they all of them had, obviously probably had a chip on their shoulder. And I remember Ron Dickerson coached up there, and I went up to visit, man. Those guys always had a, a, a really good, you know, first line of guys, it seemed like. But it seemed like once we got to their death, it became an issue for those guys. So I, I expect them to always, every single time we step on the field against them, we'll give us a dogfight. And hopefully our depth would uh, carry us through, and it has in the past. To me, the big point about this game where I think it's going to be won or lost for the Owls or Penn State is Allen Robertson, Trevor Williams, those wide, re uh, those wide receivers for Penn State like you were once uh, many years ago going up against that Temple secondary. Break down that matchup for me. Does McGloin have success on Saturday up against this Owl secondary? I think he does. I mean, I know we want to throw it a lot. You know, we've been uh, depleted a little bit in our running back. Uh, we lost our top couple guys, and uh, Dukes is coming back. He's a little banged up. Uh, we've got Doherty's playing a little bit of tailback now, which is naturally a tailback, but he's been playing fullback for Penn State. And uh, also, Bill O'Brien, 
he wants to throw the rock anyway. And uh, McGraw in his last couple of weeks is throwing it pretty good. Uh, I know we played against the Navy team last week, and uh, we knew we could exploit their secondary. I feel they'll go the same route. As long as that offensive line can protect, I think they're going to want to throw the rock around. And we got a lot of guys that have been making a few catches for us. Final one for me here, OJ. I'm just curious, what's your current involvement with the program? Have you talked to any of these wide receivers? Just give me a little bit more of an insight about these wide receivers, if you have any at all. No, I, you know, I, this, everything's so new, you know, and this, you know, the, the, the guys that are there, you know, are, you know, a lot of young guys. And me living down in Florida, all I do is, that, you know, I get information like most people do, you know, through, uh, through blogs and through, you know, through Facebook and things like that. But I just try to stay on top of the program as much as I can. So I, I see them out there. You know, I watch every single game. We go to a couple of places. You know, down here there's a couple of restaurants that have 150, 200, you know, Penn Staters watching every every game. So uh, we always get together down here to watch the game. So it's just, it's just fun watching an offense finally that, you know, I would have loved to play in, uh, you know, trying to make things happen for this team. Uh, and I love these kids. You know, these kids are important kids that, you know, that, that decide to stay. And that's why I appreciate them most because they had nothing to do with the, the situation we discussed earlier in this interview. OJ, before I let you guys, I just want to say this. I appreciate you coming on. Talking about this stuff is definitely not easy. And I was only going to ask you a few questions about Paterno and Sandusky, and I'm telling you the truth. But this issue, it just gets at me so much with what happened, and it's just disgusting. And I, and I know you probably feel the same way to even, to even think about it. And, and that's why I believe it elevated into a little bit more of a longer conversation about this, because we could go on about this all day. And it, to me, there's still a lot of facts in the case that need to come out but the facts that we have right now from these reports you know that's why there's so much talk about this and I hope you understand that I hope we don't have any kind of negative relationship because I'm a big fan of your work I love when you work with Sid Rosenberg at 790 the ticket I like the work that you do now with the Finsider I'm a big fan and I just hope that we could cut you on again and talk about something in more of a brighter light about this program and I'm sorry if I offended you in any way but I just want to let you know that these were not my intentions but this thing I, it's just so hard to wrap my brain around and it frustrates me. I've lost hours of sleep about this and I didn't even go to Penn State. I, I, I don't even cover the football program because to me it's so baffling that a football powerhouse were doing these kinds of things and I hope you understand that. Yeah, I understand that. But real quick though, man, that, and that's one of the things that bothers me as well because everybody, you know, views Penn State and Penn Staters as, you know, part of this, this whole situation as a as, as monster. We're all being vilified because we went there. Uh, you know, I've got, you know, we've got people that, you know, cars are being vandalized because they have a Penn State sticker on it or a licensed vanity player or something like that. You know, and, that, and that's the thing that, that, that's puzzling more than anything. You know, we, like, if you take back to the Virginia Tech incident, we were one of the first universities to embrace Virginia Tech when they had the mass shooting on campus. And our spring game, everybody wore Virginia Tech colors, and we were trying to, you know, support other universities. Whereas right now with the situation with, that's happened with these, with these young men, you know, we're, we're, we're ahead of the curve in trying to, you know, get the awareness out on child abuse and people taking advantage of children in this situation. Uh, you know, Penn State has always been a proud university, but we're not going to, we won't sit back either and let people associate us with Jerry Sandusky and vilify us as well. We know what he did is heinous, and he deserves to get everything that's coming to him. And I hope, you know, I hope, it, I hope it's a rough rest of his life. But at the same time, though, you know, we're, we're trying to move on and we're trying to make sure we, we help those going, moving forward. The kids that were abused and kids that won't come out and say they're abused, we hope they come out and say what's going on in their lives, too, to make everybody, you know, uh, you know, feel better about the whole situation. OJ, I appreciate the time, my man. Let's do it again real soon, and hopefully we can talk about something else uh, besides this stuff. I really appreciate it. You got it, Zach.